It's my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the Seidman College of Business at Grand Valley, H. James Williams. Dean Williams' extensive educational background includes, and now I have to read this, earning his PhD, MBA, CPA, CMA, LLM, and JD. <laughs> Prior to coming to GVSU, Dean Williams received three Teacher of the Year awards from Florida A&M and Texas Southern University. He brings a wealth of knowledge from the pi private sector, and he brings that experience to Grand Valley. I've had the privilege of working with Dean Williams over the past two years. His servant leadership and dedication to his students and faculty members is indescribable. Dean Williams is a man with a clear vision and a work ethic to accomplish anything he plans to do. He has been critical in the success of the Seidman College of Business and Grand Valley State University. It's my pleasure to introduce Dean Williams. Thank you, Doug, and thanks, thanks to all of you. First of all, I'd like to thank the Howenstein Center for inviting me to talk about leadership. You know, it's interesting because most times leaders, I suspect, and I know that I certainly don't, sit around thinking about leadership and what, what that technically means and what we should be trying to accomplish. Really what we do is have our eyes set on what we're trying to accomplish and recognizing that the way we do that is through others. I mean, in my way of thinking, that's the essence of leadership. Can you, can you get others to accomplish some goal or objective? And so we spend most of our time focused on that, not on you know, what does it take to be a real leader and, and how do you get better at it per se. On the other hand, having said that, I am sensitive to the fact that we all aspire to be good leaders and I aspire to be a good leader. One of the things I learned a long while ago is that whatever you do, there's always more to learn, there's always more uh, that you need to learn. And so I'm always careful to try to work on my skills, to work on my uh, development of leadership uh, opportunities and to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. One of the things that I do on a routine basis is when I'm having meetings, the first thing I do is ask everybody in the meeting to indulge me a moment of silence. Now I do that because it gives me an opportunity to remind myself that I'm in the leadership role here and I have to make sure that I'm doing it well. And I ask the person who is important to me, the being, if you will, to give me the grace that I need so that I can be a good leader in that meeting, so that I can make sure that I'm bringing out the best of everyone I can, uh, that who's in that meeting. So that little thing I do just to make sure that I am at least trying to be a good leader all the time. The other thing that happens, I think, you know, with, a, a, uh, you know, with an event like this is, I'm immediately honored and, and humbled, quite frankly, because apparently somebody thinks I should have something to share about leadership, uh, which, <laughs> you know, which is amazing to me in and of itself, because uh, you know, for a long while, I never considered myself a leader per se. All I wanted to do was the best job I could do with whatever I was doing. And I always knew that if I did the best job that I could at whatever I was doing, that there'd be another opportunity for me to do something even better, to have even a greater impact. And that's what has happened, and that's kind of how I found myself, found myself where I am now. That in fact, I've been able to accomplish some things through others. And I've been blessed to have all these resources around me, and I'm now talking about human resources, persons, individuals, who are committed to what they do, and they have effectively made me look good in some of the things I've done in the past. Because we have worked together as groups throughout my, my tenure as dean, and I'm now serving in my 18th year as dean. We have worked together at two other institutions before coming here to actually accomplish some things. What I'd like to do this morning, and because we're so few, I think it's good, I'll, I'll be a little more informal, if you will. But what I'd like to do is I have some thoughts and some things I certainly would like to share but I thought a good way to start this morning, assuming that we'd be a smaller group, is to ask what kinds of leadership questions and issues you'd like me to touch on. And, so, and then I'll try to touch on those while I make my comments. And then if I, don't get, if I don't hit them all, then you can follow up with questions afterwards. But anyway, allow me now to begin. And again, we'll come back to some of those questions if I don't hit them all. But there, there are a couple of things I want to make sure, for the students at least, if, if you don't walk away with anything else. You ought to work, walk away with these three things. First of all, somebody asked me about whether leaders are born or made. Born or bred, I've heard. Born or created. 
in the final analysis, I guess my reaction is, yes. <laughs> yes, in fact, leaders are born and made. And I, I think you get that and you understand that better when you start to think about what it means to be a leader and the fact that there are whole gradations of leaders. There's a spectrum of effectiveness of leaders, you know, from ineffective to super effective. And all along that spectrum, I would contend that those are leaders and they have some leadership qualities. And so when, when I think about leadership, you know, I try to make sure that I'm not, you know, fantasizing it. And too, too many of us think about, you know, the charismatic leader who, you know, is bigger than life and, and everybody thinks he or she is the greatest. And, you know, I try to, try to I mean, that's the exception in my way of thinking. And, and I look at that and think, okay, that's great, but there's so many other leaders toiling away all the time, making things happen, and quite frankly, being effective. And so I would, I would challenge the students in particular to think about that, that there are opportunities for you to be a leader, irrespective of where you might be on that spectrum. And wherever you find yourself in life, there are opportunities for you to, to be a leader and to provide leadership, and you need to take advantage of those opportunities. So that's one thing. I think leaders are born and made, and I'll say some more about that. The other thing is, I think leaders have to work to be prepared for the leadership opportunities. In fact, to be able to exploit what talent, skills, and abilities they may have, they may have going for themselves. And again, I'll say more about that, but you have to get the work in if you really want to be an effective leader. And that's, that's the same if you're trying to achieve anything, I think. You have to put the work in. The third thing is, there's always an element of luck or blessing or grace, however you want to describe it. There's always that element for effective leaders to have the opportunities. And I feel that I've been blessed in my career development for sure to have opportunities presented to me. And I heard Mark Murray say this in his presentation, he had opportunities that he hadn't quote unquote earned necessarily, that he hadn't touched all the bases necessarily, and yet folks saw enough in him to say, hey, we want to give him an opportunity to provide some leadership. And through that experience, he was able to develop himself further and be able to move to other leadership roles uh, and opportunities. So luck does play, uh, does play a part in this thing. So the development piece, the luck piece, yeah, leaders are born and made. If you, don't, if you don't remember anything else, and you remember that, I think that maybe this has been a successful morning. In terms of sort of my career, I'll tell you that when I finished undergrad, I actually wanted to be a partner in a CPA firm. And that's, what I had, and that's what I always aspired to do since I became an accounting major in undergrad. And I worked with Ernst & Young and had a great opportunity. And you know, I had so many persons working on my behalf. I had so many persons encouraging me to, uh, to accomplish and to achieve. And it's interesting because a lot of persons look at me and say, hey, you grew up in the South, and in fact, when you finished undergrad, you worked with Ernst & Young in North Carolina, in Winston-Salem, and there was still a lot of racism rampant in 1977. And I say, you were exactly right. And I happen to be one of two African Americans in the entire office. And yet, I will tell you that I had great leaders in that organization fending for me, helping me to achieve goals and objectives, and encouraging me, quite frankly. And it made all the difference in the world. It absolutely made all the difference in the world. And one of the best leaders uh, hit me early in my life. And it, it happened like this. I'm in my first year out of undergrad. I passed the CPA exam. I'm, I'm ready to move forward. The firm thinks I'm doing a great job, uh, and the, the managing partner tells me that. We have a job in Dallas, Texas now. I'm in North Carolina in Winston-Salem. We have a job in Dallas, Texas because we're the experts in transportation. And so we go to Dallas, Texas to do this audit. And I go with two managers and two senior auditors, and I'm the junior auditor. So there are five of us traveling together, Every Monday we fly down to Dallas, every Friday we fly back, and we do this for two months, okay? And we're, we're, every day there's, a major, there's another issue. 
and I'm sitting in there doing the grunt work, of course. And, but I'm privy to all this being said around me. And there's one partner that everybody was, I mean, I'm sorry, there's one manager, senior manager, that everybody just knew was never going to become a partner. And it's interesting to me because he was never going to become a partner, not because he wasn't competent, but because of the other kinds of things, the ancillary things. And that was, I mean, that was the, the wisdom. Everybody kind of understood, understood that. Then there was the other manager who was just a hard-charging ex-football player. You know, he, he always was aggressive about everything. And I watched their contrasting styles. The ex-football players, super charismatic, always sort of captured the, the, the room's attention when he walked in. The other manager was always straight-laced, and he always had his jacket buttoned. And he always had his jacket on. I mean, we always took our, our suit jackets off when we walked into the office where we were away from all the rest of the, the, the company's personnel. But he always had his jacket on and he always had it buttoned. But what I recall is every time there was an issue, every time there was a major issue, the, the, the hard charging manager would come in and say, here's what we're going to do and, 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 and this is the answer. And, and he was always so sure of everything. And the other manager was never sure. He said, well, you know, we had this on the one hand, and we have that on the other hand. And invariably, he'd look at me and say, James, what do you think? I couldn't believe it. I'm a first year junior accountant. He'd look at me and say, James, what do you think? And he'd listen to me. And I got to the point where I expected him to ask me, and so I prepared myself just a little bit better because I wanted to be able to contribute. And, and I don't know that I, all, that I ever, quite frankly, had a great answer. But, but I learned so much from the fact that he asked me every time. And he was serious about it. And, and it's also interesting, just as, 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 a, as a footnote, you know, we did that work and, and it went fairly well in the final analysis. But when we went back to Winston-Salem, it was interesting because we went back to Winston-Salem and almost as soon as we got back there, everything exploded. Our hard charging manager had been so hard charging that he had messed it up. And now we had to try to figure out how we could undo what he had done. Just a side note. At any rate, <laughs> um, so, so that was, but in my way, that was a great leadership experience for me. It taught me a very valuable lesson early on that you have to use the resources around you. And you have to engage folks to make them a part of the team and to help them understand that they have some ownership in what the results are as well. And I think that makes a big difference in leadership. The dean can't do it all. The leader can't do it all. And if the leader isn't able to direct, if the leader isn't able to inspire, as someone suggested earlier, those around him or her to do the work, then it's not going to get done. Now, when you start talking about inspiring folks, in my way of looking at the world at least, it's not just about you know, all the charisma that one might possess. Because in the final analysis, it's about how those other individuals feel and whether or not they have the wherewithal in the first place to get it done. So I think a big part of leadership is identifying those human resources that make the difference. Because it's all about human resources. I don't care what the leadership objective is. Almost invariably, it's about human resources. And so the leader's first job, in my way of thinking, is to make sure that the right persons are on the bus, as Jim Collins would say. And then you have to move them around into the right seats. And that's a big role that the leader has to play. And the leader has to then be discerning enough to understand what the talents are around him or her. You know, who has what talent? And you don't, do, you don't know that, you don't learn that, except by taking some time with individuals and getting to know them. And I think that's a very important part of what leadership is. And, and it's, it's, it's obviously a challenge. The bigger the organization, the more the hierarchical structure, the more difficult it is to make that connection with the employees. But good leaders have to find ways to communicate to the masses if they have large organizations. They have to find ways to, and it becomes even more important then, to have the right folks in the right places. Because those persons who report to the leader have to be the right persons to actually take care of the, the, you know, the rank and file, if you will. And so a big part of, of leadership, from my perspective, is being the servant, 
that understands that my job as dean is not to have folks reporting to me. My job as the leader is not to have folks serving me. My job instead is to serve those folks who report to me. When I say serve them, my job is to make sure that they have what they need to be successful. That where they have obstacles, I intercede to the extent that I can to make those, those obstacles go away so that they can get their jobs done. That they continue to develop and grow themselves so that they are then better able to serve those who report to them. And that they in turn then can serve those folks so that the persons who report to them can serve those who report to those persons. I mean, it, it, it really is a virtuous cycle in my way of thinking that is so important for great organizations. And it does start at the top because that person who is, is the quote unquote leader has to be able and ready to, to do what needs to be done to serve those who report to him or her. So, so again, I, I think that's, that's a, a super important part of, of, uh, of leadership and what we're trying to accomplish. We talk about leaders being born and made. The, the, indulge me this, this, this digression a bit at least. I have, I, I, I take this approach all the time. When I'm, when I'm interviewing folks, I'm trying to make sure that I identify the right persons. And so I'm not, and I usually tell them when they come into me, you, you know, you wouldn't be sitting with me if you didn't have the intelligence and if you didn't have uh, the other competencies to get the job done. I have search committees that have spent a lot of time pouring over your resume, you know, uh, grilling you with questions. So when you come to me, I presume that you wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have invited you here if you're not qualified to do the job. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to understand you and to learn more about who you are, and to know if you understand who you are even, quite frankly. I don't say that part to them, but that's really a big part of what I'm trying to accomplish. And one of the things I do is I give them this question every time. I ask them to indulge me first because it takes a little while. But, <laughs> but my point is I make a distinction among knowledge bases, skills, and talents. And in my way of looking at the world, knowledge bases and skills you can learn, but not talents. Talents are innate. And, and I think about talents a little bit differently. They're innate, but they are who we are almost in spite of ourselves. So for example, those persons who just like to debate, and you know them, right? I say that's a talent. I say the fact that they instinctively are predisposed or have this proclivity to debate everything. I think that's a talent because I don't think talents are necessarily positive or negative. I think it's what we make them. So that person who has that predisposition to debate can get on our nerves if they're debating every little thing just to be debating and we start to avoid them. On the other hand, those persons who take that same predisposition or proclivity and uses that to fend for those who can't fend for themselves, to advocate for those who are less fortunate, now we're taking the talent and using it wisely. Now we're taking the talent and making it a positive. So, so I start there. And then my question is, given my definition of talent, what do you identify as your talent or talents? In other words, who are you almost in spite of yourself? I'm asking that question because I want to know something about what, this make, what makes this person tick. And what is this person going to want to do sort of naturally, if you will, instinctively? Because that, that gives me some real insight, I think, into, into what that person can bring to the table. Now, having said that, on the other hand, there are skills and knowledge bases. And I read somewhere that, yeah, leaders are, are, are born and made because you have to be born at least with the intelligence to do what you need to do to achieve your objectives. And so if you say you want to be a leader, you have to at least have the intelligence to figure out what that means and then to do what's necessary. Now, you may not be the top leader, but you at least will be a leader uh, and maybe can get accomplished or you have to be able to get accomplished what you're trying to accomplish. So have that little, at, at least that level of intelligence. And what that suggests is that if in fact that's all you need, then you can learn 
in fact, to be a leader. The problem is, if you don't have some, some innate abilities, if you don't have some predisposition for, for, for leading, for being out front, for being willing to, to take or to deal with all that is attendant to being a leader, then it makes it, for a, it makes a difficult life. And it makes it difficult for folks to be able to continue through all that must be done and all that must be endured if you want to be the leader. That makes it difficult. But again, I think it's possible. And I think in limited cases, you can be successful. And I would suggest for limited periods of time. But the point is that I think folks really can learn to be leaders. And I think they can be effective in certain, um, given whatever, the, in given certain objectives. So, leaders, the full spectrum. You guys are probably familiar with Jim Collins' work, right? Good to great. Well, that's what I have on the screen here because Jim Collins talks about level five leaders. And I just read uh, Steve Jobs. You guys read that book? Anybody read that book yet? I read the Steve Jobs book uh, a few months ago now. Seems like, seems like forever ago. But I did, a, I, did do a, uh, I did do a book review on it because I, I was moved. I mean, I, I, I didn't know, really know the man. I didn't know a lot about the man even. Uh, but the book was, was quite enlightening for me. I then read another, another briefer book that just has all of his quotes throughout his lifetime. That was interesting too and much quicker read. But that was, that was, quick. that was, that was really good too. But what occurred to me is he obviously was an effective leader. He obviously was what Apple needed the first time, and he was what Apple needed the second time. He was obviously what Pixar needed when he, when he took the role there. And, and on the other hand, he was clearly, in my way of thinking, not a level five leader. Absolutely not a level five leader, as I interpret a level five leader's, uh, the leader description that Jim Collins provides. And yet he was effective. And a lot of the persons who were interviewed said, you know, I didn't like the SOB, but boy, he motivated me and he got me to achieve things that I didn't even think I could achieve. I mean, that, that's pretty high praise. And, and, and all of us as leaders would love to have folks be able to say that about us. Not the, I didn't like the SOB part, but the, but the part that they were inspired somehow, or they were pushed, or they were cajoled or or threatened or whatever it took, but that they were able to achieve more than they even thought they could achieve. I mean, that's, again, that's pretty significant in my way of looking at the world. And on the other hand, that's clearly not a level five leader. And that's clearly not somebody with whom I would like to work personally. I do not think that I could excel in that set of circumstances. I don't think I could. I think I would have endured it to do the work I had to do, to provide for my family, for as long as I had to, and all the time I'd be looking to do something else. And then I would get out. The level five leader, and you guys you probably can't read that now, as I see that now, but level one, two, three, four, and five, you know, Collins determined what the characteristics are of the level five leader by actually examining successful companies. And successful, successful companies that had a long period of success, not you know, four or five years at the top, but 15 years, 20 years of success, and looked at those leaders who were able to make that happen. And based on those leaders, he identified the character traits. And what he learned is, first of all, all these levels he deems to be leadership levels. And that the level five leader has to possess all of the other leadership abilities. The level one, the level two, level three, level four. In other words, the person has to be a highly capable individual, has to be a contributing team member, has to be a competent manager, has to be an effective leader in order to be a level five leader. And if you think about it, that makes all the sense in the world. If I'm going to lead your organization, I must be able to work with groups, not just inside the company, but outside the company. I have to be a team player. I have to be able to discipline myself, I have to be an individually capable person. I have to have something to bring to the table in the way of competency to get the work done. 
and I have to be able to achieve goals and objectives. And then maybe I'm prepared to be the level five leader according to, to, um, to Jim. And this executive leader here, what, make, what makes the distinction between the effective leader and the level five leader, and again, he's defining this in terms of how companies have been able to sustain success to be great companies for a long time. And he says the difference is that there's this paradoxical combination of personal humility and professional will. That when he looked at all those great leaders for those great companies that have sustained excellence over extended periods of time, that was the difference. That he didn't find the charismatic leader. That instead, those persons were unassuming, quiet, sometimes even shy, but always deflected praise to everybody around him or her. Never wanted to accept the praise for him or herself. Personal humility on the one hand. Uh, they talked about looking in the mirror every time there was a concern about poor performance and who to blame, if you will. But then looking through the window whenever he was trying to or she was trying to, in fact, attribute credit for successes. Never looked in the mirror when it came to successes. Was always looking out. And you know, we were successful because John was able to do this. And because the group was able to do this. And because for so many years, those who came before me, you know, set the groundwork. So that's the level five leader piece. But that level five leader has to have all of these other character traits, according to Jim Collins. And I think that makes some sense. And so if you also buy this, then you'd also buy that there are opportunities, levels one through four, to be effective and to be effective quote unquote leaders. In a personal way, in terms of working with the, with the small team to make some things happen, in terms of being the competent manager to, to manage resources and to organize resources to be most effective, in terms of being a great executive leader with that commitment to, to, the, to pursue the compelling uh, vision. Now, somebody talked about vision earlier. Now, the question was, you know, how do you how do you communicate that vision? Well, first of all, I'll tell you that I always look, I always look uh, a little askance, and I'm always concerned when in an interview someone asks someone who's going to assume a leadership role, what's your vision for the place? Now, I'm not looking askance at the question, but I look askance at the person who provides the answer. If that person starts to talk about what the vision is, I'm concerned right away. That's my personal opinion. I'm concerned right away. Because my question is, how do you know what a, an appropriate vision is until you know the company, until you know its history, until you know, and, and, and however prepared you might be for an interview, you can't assess the, all the human resources around you unless you are there. You can read everything in the world, but in the final analysis, it depends on the folks around you. Those are the persons who are gonna get it done, and you have to get it done through them. And, so, and the other thing is, folks talk about a shared vision. Well, you don't share a vision if you create it and then force it on everybody. A shared vision ought to be a shared vision. And so my approach to this, and I, I've been asked this question a ton of times myself, my approach is, we're going to have an appropriate vision for sure because we know we need something uh, to target. But we're gonna create that vision together. We're going to talk about who we are, we're gonna identify what our strengths are, we're going to identify that hedgehog concept, and I'm going to be very uh, active in that process. But I'm not going to dictate to the group what we ought to be doing. I hope that if I'm leading them properly, we're going to be able to lead ourselves and get ourselves to where we need to be to identify the right vision for us as an organization or for us as a unit. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the leader doesn't have a responsibility to make sure that there is this viable vision and that persons buy into it. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just concerned about how it gets done. And again, I'm, I'm really, and so for, for my vantage point, that's the way I've always worked at it. And you know, sometimes persons just want you to hand them the vision. And I know that, and I've, I've been in, in, in at places where faculty have not been so pleased that I, can't, I, that I don't tell them, or I don't answer that question in an interview, that this is what the vision is. 
What I can typically do is to tell them what I've identified as an outside, uh, as an outside person looking in, I've, what I've identified as the strengths of this organization and what some potential avenues for, you know, for success might be. But in terms of developing that vision, we've got to do it differently. So at any rate, that, that executive leader can do that, though. I don't have to be a level five leader to do it. And again, that's not casting aspersions at those other, other leadership levels. Because again, those are important too. And if I'm the level five leader, I hope I have some persons uh, at the executive leader level, competent manager level, contributing team member level, and the personal, um, high, highly capable individual level. I hope I have persons in each of those categories so that I can be successful. The chances are that I'm gonna be more successful if I do. And as a leader, that's one of my key pieces, my key concerns. How do I get the right persons on the bus? How do I assure they have the right talents? Now, one of the things about the level five leader, though, that is, that's critically important, and I focused on the humility aspect of it, but the other, other aspect is the professional will piece. And that can't be taken lightly. You know, it's always interesting to me when somebody says, you know, that guy's over there fighting, you know, in the, in the hockey match because he hates to lose. And, and that guy, you know, is, is cursing everybody out on the football team because he hates to lose. And, and that person is being disrespectful to the, to the reporter after the basketball game because he hates to lose. He's a real competitor. And my reaction is, you don't have to be like that to be a real, a real competitive person. The fact that I'm acting like a fool doesn't mean that I'm more competitive than the person who can discipline him herself or herself. I really have a problem with that all the time. And, and I remember a person in an interview one time uh, it implied as much to me. And, and I, I told him I'm as competitive as anybody. And I know that. I know that in my gut. But I don't go around acting like a fool to try to convince somebody that I, I don't want to lose or I don't like losing. I have to be disciplined enough as a leader to, to address that in a reasonable way. I, I, have a, I have a problem with that. But at any rate, being competitive, being, um, having a, a professional sense of we have to get it done, irrespective of what it takes, however many hours it takes, and being willing to do the hard thing. You know, I have some folks, you know, in leadership roles, quite frankly, and I've seen folks in leadership roles who don't want to do the hard things. They are not going to fire somebody no matter how difficult it is, no matter how much that person is contaminating, if you will, the workplace. Well, you're not a, in my way of thinking, you're not the right kind of leader if you aren't willing to do those tough things. It devolves upon the leader to get that done. You need to do it the right way. Again, you don't have to be um, uh, disagreeable in order to get it done. There's a right way even to fire a person. And I'm convinced of that. And I'm convinced that if you do it, if you, if you treat persons the way you'd like to be treated, then you can get those difficult things done at least as palatably as possible. And there's always going to be some hurt feelings. There's always going to be you know, some, some turmoil around that. But that's what the leadership role is about. And it's been my experience that that's every day what it's about. It's about humanity. All the time, there is a personal, a personality, an individual kind of issue. Virtually every day. And there are two or three of those most times. Rarely is it about the dollars and cents of things. Almost never. It's always about how do I deal with this situation because it affects that person or it affects that group of persons. Or how do I get that group of persons to understand why we need to do that, most, that difficult thing or that thing that they think we ought not do. That's what, that's, in my way of thinking, that's what leadership has been about. And that's certainly been my experience. And I think the good leader has to be willing to deal with those and to recognize that he or she is going to be in some uncomfortable situations and, and will have to do some things that none of us like to do. And you hope not on a regular basis, but it's still you, you have to get those things done. And so, again, the personal humility piece, the professional will piece, um, it's all about results. And I think the leader has to be comfortable with the fact that I'm going to be judged on results in the final analysis. You know, when we were interviewing for folks in, in, the pri in private industry, when we were interviewing, what we'd ask the young persons is not what they'd done in college, and, and even not, not even what they'd done in high school. 
we'd ask, describe for me, you know, what a typical day was when you were 12. What'd you do? Because what we're looking for at those times is who has some sort of innate, innate leadership abilities? Who, who even at that time was willing to step out? Who did persons tend to follow? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I remember in my neighborhood what happened. And I reflect on, on what happened in my neighborhood when I was 11, 12, 13, and 14. And those persons who stepped, who stepped up and stepped out then are the persons who proved to be the real leaders. They were willing to step out. They were willing to take chances. They were willing to commit. It's, it's interesting to me. And I think those persons probably had some, some natural predisposition toward leadership. On the other hand, and, <laughs> and this notion about, about what it takes to be good leaders and what happens if you, if you have bad leaders, clearly if you have bad leaders, the organization is in jeopardy. I've had, I've had experiences you know, when I left Georgetown University, where I had been for eight years as a faculty member, I went to, I went to another university, and I won't call the name, to, uh, to, because I wanted to, to get into administration. I started to think that I could maybe do more as an administrator in, academic, in, in the academy than I could as a faculty member. The things that I thought weren't being done correctly or the emphases that I thought weren't being made appropriately. I thought I could do that if I, were the, if I were an administrator, if I were the dean at some point. But I wasn't really thinking about being a dean at that point. I was just thinking about being in administration and having a voice. And the, the dean at the school assured me, yes, that makes sense. And I trusted that dean, because that dean had actually helped me when that dean didn't know me. As an MBA student, when I first decided that I'd like to go into the academy, Someone said, well, you ought to call that dean, because that program has been great, and that dean is great, and that dean will help you. And so I called, and that dean did help me. Didn't know me from anybody, but I called that person and said, look, I'm considering uh, a career in academia. And someone told me that you're a person who can help me, so help me, please. And in fact, that dean said, well, here's what you ought to do, and here's some schools you ought to consider, and, Here's, you know, here are the, 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 the risk factors, and here's how you can be successful. Boom, and I followed that advice, and I was successful. And so that dean recruited me, and I didn't go right away. And the dean was persistent and recruited me for 10 years, 12 years, but I didn't go right away. And finally, when I talked to that dean and told that dean, yeah, I'd like to be involved in administration. I think I can have an impact. The dean said, sure, you come join us. And, and I'll give you that, that opportunity. And so I said, okay, great. So I left Georgetown, and luckily I didn't move. My family was still in the Northern Virginia area, so I commuted, um, because I was still a faculty member, but I was going to be given administrative responsibilities early on. So I commuted down to, uh, how was that, about, about 800 miles, I guess. So I flew out every Monday morning, flew back every Friday evening uh, for a year. And when I got there, things didn't work out the way the dean had promised. And I was, I was identified as, you know, as a, uh, a great faculty member and the students loved me and I won two teaching awards, one at the college business level and one at the university level. And when I talked to the, to the dean, I said, you know, I, I really do want to get into administration, though, and that's what we talked about. And the dean said, yeah, but you're such a great teacher. You're such a great teacher. You really do need to stay in the, in the classroom. I thought, wait a minute now. Now, I appreciate that, and I appreciate it, and I take that as a compliment. But, you know, but you did promise me this. And I didn't realize then that that was just the tip of the iceberg. That was just the tip of the iceberg. This dean, who was great, lacked the integrity in the final analysis. That dean had promised, promised to pay me some funds for the summer and didn't. And when I said to the dean, well, you know, um, this was short of what you promised for the summer. The dean says, oh, okay, I'll pay. Okay, what you need to do is create a, an invoice Give it to me and I'll pay you. I said, invoice for what? 
It doesn't matter. Create the invoice and I'll pay. Well, obviously, I didn't stay there very long. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that that dean, so highly respected, and not just by myself, across the country, this dean was highly respected. And that dean said to me, just create an invoice. And it doesn't matter what, anything. And I'll pay you the money. And so, you know, I didn't say much. I just started looking around. And so then I got my first associate uh, assistant dean's position. And I traveled to that assistant dean's position. And the dean there, you know, was very aggressive, very charismatic. Folks said a great leader. And that dean was interesting. <laughs> um, we had a, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, these are all the things that, that I have in my sort of experience bank from which I've learned. But I recall that this dean had us, um, we had a scholarship contest for graduate students, and they had to write essays in order to secure the scholarship. And I was responsible as the assistant dean. I was responsible for these scholarships. And so, so we had a good competition, and we had to identify the winner. So I go to the dean, and I say, here's our winner, XYZ person. Outstanding candidate, outstanding essay. And the dean looks at me and says, yeah, I know that person. There's no way that person wins that scholarship. Honest to goodness, you're not going to believe this, but honest to goodness, that person doesn't win that scholarship because she is not attractive enough. And I should tell you then that that dean was a female. The dean was a female. And the dean told me, that person isn't attractive enough. Now, the dean was fairly attractive, OK? Uh, but, 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 the point, but the point is, when the dean said that to me, I said, can you believe you and I are in here talking about whether somebody's attractive? I was so disgusted. I was so disgusted. So the dean actually you know, took that responsibility away from me because I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that. So I was only there for a year as well. And then I got my first dean's position. Um, but, but those are examples, in my way of thinking, of, of absolutely poor leadership. And incidentally, as an addendum, as a footnote, that dean, very aggressive, very charismatic. In fact, she used to be an entertainer. Ascended to the presidency just like that. The presidency of that university, just like that. And about, and that, oh, that was over a period of about six years or seven years or so before I heard about the dean again. She was now president. She was being indicted for mismanaging university's funds, for spending the university's funds on a personal residence kind of thing. And, you know, saying that the, the funds have been mismanaged to the tune of almost a million dollars. And in, and in Texas, they are hard. She could, have been, she could have been given 100 years in prison, apparently, for stealing money from the state. Now, as it turns out, there was a hung jury. So as, I, as far as I know, she's not actually spending time in jail. But it's interesting because it didn't surprise me. Because at the time when, when I worked with that dean, that dean you know, was always trying to cut corners and was always willing to do something that I thought was untoward. And I just said, you know, I can't be associated with this. Because my point has always been, how long can you be in it and not of it? And so I, need, I always tried to, to distance myself from that kind of behavior. But that's bad, that's bad leadership in my way of thinking. On the other hand, you talk about great leadership. When we talk about the level five leader, Level five leaders are always more concerned about the organization than they are about themselves. And, and that's a part of that humility thing. But they want to make sure that the organization flourishes, and not just while they are leaders. They want to make sure that the persons who follow them are able to be successful as well. So that level five leader almost always identifies a great successor. And that, and that leader doesn't have to 
hope that in fact the organization falters because then they see how great this leader was because after all somebody else now comes in and it can't work. That's not the way the level five leader works. And it is interesting to me because that first dean I told you about, again, everybody thought that leader, that dean was great. And so did I. So did I. But when that, when that dean retired and that dean's position became available, I was actually interviewed for the position. And when I got to that institution and went through that day, that day of interview, by the time the day was over, I said, no, thank you. Please withdraw my name. Because that place was a mess. That dean had created so many challenges and had pit one group against the other so effectively that the place was not fit as an academic institution and business for my way of thinking. I wanted no parts of it. And it had been a great organization under the leadership of that other person. But that was a clear example of a person, again, who may have been, you know, the level four leader, may have been the level four leader, but clearly was not the level five leader. On the other hand, look at somebody like Don Lovers, and many of you know Don Lovers. I mean, I, I wasn't here while he was leading, and obviously, you know, absolutely none of us is perfect. But I feel fairly comfortable saying Don Lovers was a great leader. And I say he still is. But you look at what has happened to this organization. And you look at what he did to set this organization up so that it can move smoothly into the future and be successful. I remember that Mark Murray chatted with me about assuming the role of president here. And what he said to me is, you know, this place is great. He said, what I have to do is to make sure I don't mess it up. Now, I know he was saying that somewhat tongue in cheek, but his, but his point was, I was handed a gem. I need to make sure that I move it forward so when the next person takes over, that person has a gem that shined even a little bit brighter. And, and, that's, and that's the way level five leaders think in my way of thinking. So some examples of some great leaders, I think. A couple of examples of some bad leaders, some bad leaders. And I probably said enough, and I didn't answer all the questions. So now if you guys want to answer me quick questions, I think we still have some time, right? OK, questions? And I know there were a lot of questions I didn't, I didn't touch on. So please ask those questions again. I'd love to answer them. Well, my, my question was, um, you know, a lot of students will, like Doug read off your, uh, your litany or ABCs of uh, degrees, a lot of students see someone like you and think, wow, man, that, that guy has just skyrocketed to the top. But um, I think it's important for them to challenge you. Um, and you, you certainly talked about you know, some of your Well, a, a couple of things. I, I think, I think that the biggest thing for me in, in assuming a leadership role was learning how to have thick enough skin so that I could endure the challenges that I'd have to endure. Because invariably, somebody doesn't like what I do, almost invariably. And it's my, been my experience that, you know, the more aggressive, the more sort of um, innovative, future-oriented, I get the less likely folks are going to approach, uh, appreciate it. Uh, and when I do the hard things that have to be done, you know, folks will say mean things. And quite frankly, that was the most difficult thing for me in, in becoming a leader. I had, to, I had some, some really long days and nights learning how to how to let some of that stuff bounce off because it doesn't bounce off. I'm a sensitive person. That's one of my talents. Uh, I'm very sensitive sometimes to a fault. Um, it helps me because I'm able to empathize very much with students and faculty and staff and those around me. And I care a lot about persons around me. But I'm sensitive enough that those, those things are, are sharp and biting. And so the biggest challenge for me was figuring out how to deal with those and how to not allow them to deter me, to not allow them, quite frankly, to uh, discourage me. And when persons, you know, and on evaluations, I mean, we get evaluations, and I get evaluated by all the faculty. And obviously, some faculty are mean-spirited. And I'm not saying it just because it's faculty, but folks who are doing evaluations, sometimes they're mean-spirited. 
And so when I read those, some of those evaluations, again, that's a tough part of it is, you know, you got, you got to read it and on the one hand you think, that is so unfair, that's so mean-spirited. And, you want, and, and my initial reaction is to, to discount it. I've learned over the years that I can't just discount it that way. What I have to do is absorb it first, recognize that this is somebody's opinion, somebody might, might have a bone to pick, whatever the co case might be, but then after I've had a chance to go through, I'm going to have to go back and, and reflect and say, what is it? Is there anything in this comment that is of substance? Then I have to, deal in a, I have to engage in a great deal of introspection to figure out, is there a kernel of truth in this criticism, for example? Or is there something here that can help me to become a better leader? And I do that routinely now. But it took a while for me to get there. <laughs> you know, it took a while for me to get there. The first reaction was, hey, I don't need this. You know, if you don't need me to serve as dean, fine. I could go do this and I can go do that. Uh, so that was my first reaction as a leader. I don't need this. I could do better than this. Um, but on the other hand, I recognized it's an opportunity to grow. Even the mean-spirited stuff is an opportunity to grow. So that, that would be the toughest thing for me. But I had great mentors throughout. I really did. Uh, in undergrad, I had, a, I had a mentor who was a chairperson of the accounting department who said to me, you have, some, you have some real talent, young man. You have some real abilities, and you, need to, and you need to maximize those, and here's how you do it. And he sat down and talked to me. And, and I gotta give you this one example because, because, again, I learned so much about leadership from this person. When I, was a, when I, I went to school, I was a history major. And I was a history major because I didn't know anything else. My parents didn't finish high school, so they couldn't really help me figure out what major I would, I would have. And in our neighborhood, we didn't have lawyers and doctors and, you know, we had one teacher, I think, on our street, maybe two blocks up. So, but I was going to college and my parents knew I was going to go to college. But when I went there as a freshman, I chose history just because I loved history. I didn't really think, okay, so what is this going to do for me and what am I going to do later and all this. And, and after my freshman year, my sister said to me, you know, I, and she was a history major as well, incidentally. She said, I can't find a job. She says, but those folks in business are finding jobs. She said, you need to change your major to business. <laughs> now, that's what my sister said to me. And, you know, thank goodness I had done a great job my freshman year. So I had great grades. So when I went over to the business school and said, hey, I want to change my major, they said, wow, we love that. And they gave me scholarships and all that kind of stuff. And they, and they, and they brought me in. But I remember the first, my sophomore year, I was taking this intro to, intro to accounting class. And the faculty member had us, Every year, I mean, every day we'd come into class and she'd go over all the stuff, but she never collected her homework. But I, but I sat in the front row and I paid attention and I was following along and I was doing my homework. I mean, I was doing my reading. But after the first two or three classes, when I realized she wasn't taking up the homework, I stopped doing the homework. I just, just went to class and paid attention and, and listened. So when it was time for us to get ready for the exam, the exam was going to be on that Friday. And so I concluded, here's how I'll do this. On Thursday, I'll go into the library first thing in the morning. I don't have any classes. I'll stay in there and I'll do all the homework. That'll be a great review. I felt comfortable that I knew the material, but I'll go through, those, through all those problems and that'll be a great review. I'll be ready for the exam. So I would go to the library at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning and I start on my first chapter. And I didn't get through the third problem before I had a problem. So I get up and scurry over to the, to the building uh, from the library and I'm going to see my professor. Well, it didn't occur to me that my professor might not be in. Didn't occur to me that, that she might not be teaching on Thursday. So sure enough, she wasn't there. And in fact, the hallways were pretty much empty. And all the doors were closed. And there was one door open. And it was the chairperson of the, of the accounting, accounting department. So I went in sheepishly and said, you know, Mr. Thompson, um, could you help me with the, with the question I have uh, on, on one of these problems? He says, sure, young man, come in. And then he didn't know me. I didn't, he didn't know me from anybody. Come in, have a seat. I, I, I sat down and, and I asked him a question. Now, he had the answer book. He could have just given me the answer, but he didn't. He started asking me questions. Well, what about this? And what about that? And by the time he finished his questions, I had answered my own question. And I knew the answer. And so I thanked him and, 
I, I went back over to the library and I started working again, boom, boom, boom. So maybe an hour later, I got another question. So I get up and I go back over there and now I'm even more sheepish because I already interrupted him once. And I go in and I say the same thing and he says, no problem, he sits, down, he sits me down. And again, he could have given me the answer and been done, but he didn't. Again, he went through the same routine, the same ritual. He asked me a whole slew of questions until I answered my own question. And then I went back over to the library and he said, no, by the way, I'll be here all day, don't worry. <laughs> and sure enough, sure enough, I came, I, I came all throughout the day, okay? And then the day was almost over. It was about five o'clock now. I've been in there all day. It's about five o'clock and I realize I have another question. And I realize it's almost five o'clock. They're leaving. I jump up and I run over there and it's after five by the time I get there. And he, he's closing the door and he's walking out and he started to walk down the hallway and I'm walking in behind him and he must sense that I'm back there. He turns around and he sees me. He says, oh, you have another question? Yes, sir. <laughs> he goes back into his room. He takes off his coat. He sits down. He sits me down and he goes through the same process again. I mean, that just blew me away. But that, in my way of thinking, is real leadership. That's servant leadership. He was the chairperson of the department, and he didn't think students should be serving him. He thought he should be serving students. In my way of thinking, that's, that's, that's a quintessential leader. And he always, you know, from that point forward, he was always concerned about sort of how are you doing and, and what's going on and giving me advice. So, I mean, so he was a great mentor. And when I went to Ernst & Young, managing partner was a great mentor. Uh, uh, was a great mentor. And you know, you talk about luck being a part of things, but you also talk about establishing relationships. And when I was in my PhD program, you know, working hard and trying to figure out how to get it done relatively quickly, I get a phone call from the partner in charge of the office in Winston-Salem for Ernst & Young. And he says, James? I say, yes. He says, how would, you like, how would you like a fellowship to finish your PhD program? I'd like to recommend you for one. And sure enough, with the partner in charge of that office nominating me, I mean, I got that fellowship and that, made, you know, that obviously smoothed my, my entry into the workforce. I was able to finish that PhD in record time and get into the profession much sooner than I otherwise would have been able to do it because of the relationships, but because of the leadership of these guys who were not just concerned about themselves, but they were concerned about the organization and they were concerned about the individuals in the organization. And that was pretty clear to me, long-winded response. Any other final questions? I don't know how much time I have. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, very good. Well, you don't get to sit down yet. Ah. <laughs> you get to stand up and be a leader about two more minutes. I just want to say, first of all, you've been our neighbor at the Hallenstein Center for a number of years now. And Dean Williams has been an outstanding neighbor. He's been a guy that, that I know I've relied on occasionally. We've talked, I remember we had a joint program in Florida right. a few years ago. He's always been there for us. So when you listen to Dean Williams, you're listening to the real article. Not somebody who can just talk about Jim Collins, could be great, but I think somebody who exemplifies all the values that you've been talking about and really appreciate all that you bring to Grand Valley. So thank you, and on behalf of Ralph Hallenstein, the Hallenstein Center, for presidential studies, and in appreciation of your presentation, we want to give you a signature Ralph Hallenstein tote bag. So wow. here you go. Dean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.